All right, so let's start. And um, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you today as our first speaker, Alexander Genis, whose participation in this course has for me a very personal significance. For me, it is hard to imagine Russian immigration in New York City without Sasha Genis. He was in many ways a defining figure who connects different so-called waves of Russian immigration that we talked about in this class. The Wikipedia entry for Alexander Genius calls him a writer, broadcaster, and cultural critic. But of course, for many of us, including me and my parents who arrived in New York City in 1990s, Genius was a figure who enabled us to make sense of this abrupt and traumatic experience of abandoning one's homeland. Alexander Genius is an established writer, literary critic, and radio broadcaster. Born in Rizan, Russia in 1953, he grew up in Riga, Latvia, and immigrated to the US in 1977. Alexander Genius is a true cosmopolitan, full of passion for world culture that influences his texts. Milorad Pavic compared the text Genius creates to a pulsating stream of explosions. Alexander Genius hosted weekly audio magazine American Hour on Radio Liberty, the TV show Letters from America, TV channel Culture, and wrote columns for several periodicals. His numerous books reflect the author's biculturalism. Russian and American manifestations of civilization are compared. A shrewd and observant writer, Genis pioneered the trend of cultural essays. A specific genre combining lyrical narrative with methods used in cultural studies. Alexander Genis is probably the best essayist at work in the Russian language today. In his work, Genis has incorporated traits the Western European and American tradition, wordplay, wit, and precision. His essays are dynamic, informative, and a consistently unfolding feast of joy for readers. And you read some today. Alexander Genis's essays have been translated into English, Japanese, German, French, Italian, Serbian, Hungarian, Latvian, and other languages and included in various, various anthologies and university studies. There are as yet only a few full length books in translation, however. Well, that needs to be corrected, I'm sure. So um, today is not a formal lecture, as I told you. We're gonna start with a couple of questions that I uh, sent Sasha um, prior to this meeting. So I'm gonna start with my question and then um, I will get to yours. Um, again, giving you the authorship of your question. So uh, Sasha, I want to uh, start by thanking you for agreeing to be here today. And I wanna ask a rather difficult question, which rings especially relevant because of the times we're living through. The question is about trauma and more precisely trauma of abandoning one's country, one's language. In your opinion, what do you think is common to all immigrants in the US and what sets the Russian immigrants apart? What unites the Russian immigrants in each of the waves that perpetuates the trauma of immigration? Thank you very much. First of all, I'm very grateful for your introduction and I am very grateful for all these questions that you sent me. And I think that it is very nice to uh, give me such attention for my writing, for my thoughts, and I'd like to share whatever I can and answer as good as I can. Talking about trauma of immigration, it's a terrible thing for everybody. And if I would like to make it very short, I said only one thing, the loss of status. First of all, for everybody, when you came to America, you started your life anew. And it's very difficult for everybody. Can you imagine that you have a ladder and you climb the ladder half of your life? And in the middle of your life, you find out that you found out that uh, the wall that you climbing is the wrong one. And all what you did before doesn't matter. And it's a very, very painful experience. And uh, if we talk about Russian immigrants, we have three waves. Basically, that's what you're supposed to know is that we have three waves of immigration. And each one is uh, connected with the people who escaped from one or another 
uh, Russian tyrant. People who escaping from Lenin, it was the first wave of immigration. And I knew all of them. People who escaped from Stalin, it's the second wave. And people who escaped from Brezhnev, it's our way, third wave. And of course, now we have the fourth wave, people who are escaping from Putin. But this is a current situation. You can talk about it, it's too early maybe to make any, anything concrete about this. But talking about these three waves, it looks like this. If you uh, make it short and uh, concise, you lost your status. You've been a duke and you became a cab driver. You've been at the first wave. In the second wave, you've been an officer, you became a cab driver. The third wave, you've been a film director and you became a cab driver. So it's very, very understandable that you lost a lot. And uh, you have to start the game. It's, a, it's like a new experience and it's very difficult. But somehow, Everybody that I knew became successful in this experience. Maybe we have a spring in our life, in our soul, in our brain. And when you have very difficult situation, you start it again because you have the spring. I am not sure that you can have another spring. In, in the second immigration was impossible for almost anybody. That's why I don't know a lot of people who come back to Russia after uh, communism was fell down and people started to think that maybe they can do reverse immigration and come back to the uh, Russia. But very few people did this because we don't have another spring in our life. We don't have another spring in our soul and to do it again. And that's why we're still here. But of course, some people did this re reverse immigration, like Solzhenitsyn, but he was very special. Guy. Okay. Uh, what else? The so, um, we we what? started our class with some readings from Joseph Brodsky. So we didn't necessarily go in the chronological order, but we read uh, Brodsky's Nobel uh, Prize speech, and then we read uh, his the condition uh, we call exile, and. Um, of course, the conversation about New York City um, is central to his immigrant experience. And what, in your opinion, New York City means for Russian immigration? How was New York City as an, a space for the Russian immigration different from other cities uh, where our compatriots found their new home, like Paris, or we're going to talk about Berlin for Nabokov? Um, so, how do you feel for you personally? And for people you knew in Russian immigration in New York City, how is the city became the shaper of the immigrant experience? New York City, I'm very grateful to this place because it was very good for everybody. And that's explain why so many people live in New York. Half of the population of New York City were born outside of the United States. It's not really America. Baudrillard, Jean Baudrillard said once that uh, New York City is artificial satellite of the Earth. So it's not really a city, it's not really America, it's a world in itself. And for Russians, it was very good too, because we can live with our uh, roots. Of course, the famous little Odessa, Brighton Beach, is a odious place and everybody knew that there's a mafia place and so on and so on, but it's not the whole truth. First of all, we have a lot of other Russian places in the city like everybody else. You have, you can visit any country in the world not leaving New York City. It can be Poland, it can be Israel, it can be all Latin American countries and so on and so on. And for me, New York, it's a big smorgasbord. I can choose who I am every day. I can eat in Chinese restaurant, went to uh, Metropolitan Opera to listen Italian opera and so on and so on. And it's very important that you are not really in America. Of course, that's another cities with Russian 
places in it like Los Angeles, Chicago, Boston, but New York is the biggest in all of them. And it's not a coincidence that the best Russian poet, Brodsky, lived in New York, and the best Russian prose writer, Davlatov, also lived in New York. And the most famous Russian guy, Barishnikov, also lived in New York. I think that uh, New York became a capital of Russian immigrants, like it used to be Paris in the, for the first wave of immigrants in, in the 30s and the 20s. But our life was much, much better than theirs. They were very poor. They were, it was very difficult for, for, for Russian people in Paris. In New York was more uh, tolerant to us. And I am very grateful for this. You know, I knew people who came to New York from Paris and from Europe after the war, during the war. And all of them uh, compared these two cities and they said that Paris, of course, is much better than New York because it's the cultural capital of the world. But you can live only in New York City and never come back to Paris again. And it's interesting, of course. Of course, they are, in Paris, they have a wonderful Russian culture too. I knew a lot of people who was very successful in uh, Paris, like Andrei Sinyavsky, wonderful Russian writer, who lived all his life in Paris, on immigrant life. Only. And when he came to New York, he said, we were friends. He said, no, I can't live in New York City because it's too young and too energetic. You can't be quiet in this city for a moment. That's true. It's a difficult uh, city to live, and it's very nice to be young in this city. And I still like it for all my heart. And I, every day I found something else. It's, uh, no, I still have a guide to New York City after 40, 40 plus years in living here. I still study the city because it's incredibly rich. Thank you. Um, I want to ask a question that's probably a, a bit difficult uh, for all of us who found ourselves here, um, you know, from the wreckage of the Soviet Union. Um, uh, like you, I was not born in Russia and I'm not strictly speaking Russian. Um, and yet we grew, we all grew on Russian culture. We are imbued with its poetry and music and um, um, the just general sort of feel of what Russia is as a landscape and as a cultural space. Um, however, do you think that for people who were not ethnically Russian, um, the abandonment of Russia came at a lesser cost than to those who had an ethnic connection with Russia, who were ethnically Russian. Uh, do you think that ethnic identity even matters when it comes to exile and immigration? I think that the most important is the language. If you're Russian speaking, you're Russian. That's very easy in America. In Russia, it's not so easy because you can be a Jew, for example. And if you're a Jew, it's a completely different story. But if you're Russian speaking here, you are Russian for everybody and you are more than that. You are Soviet. And this is very interesting phenomenon because my friend, uh, Professor Mikhail Epstein, who's teaching in uh, Atlanta, Emory University. Once he said very uh, smart thing. He said that Soviet Union is dead for everybody. That's no Soviet Union anymore. Maybe for Putin, but not for anyone else. But here in America, we still Soviet people, and you can find all this Soviet life in Brighton Beach, for example. And it's funny, but it's true. And uh, I think that we are the last relics of the Soviet Union, like dinosaurs, you know, from Soviet life. And uh, ethnicity itself, it's not important as long as you are speaking Russian, you live in Russian culture. And uh, if you don't, for example, Latvians, I live all my life, the first half of my life in Latvia. And people who came from Latvia became Latvians and they have their own union, their own uh, places to, to celebrate your ethnicity, but not Russians. Russians are everywhere and we are not very good in unions, any kind of unions. And uh, that's why I think that 
Russian is still in our soul, in our mind, in our library, and in our kitchen, first of all. I think that maybe the most important uh, thread that connected us with the Soviet Union is cuisine. And first thing that Russia came, uh, when they came to America, they opened Russian food store. We have in New Jersey, not far from New York, huge Russian food store, supermarket that used to call Gurmanov. It's a play of word. Yeah? And uh, it was funny, it came to that because you can see the cold Soviet Union on this place. It can be Armenian cheese, it can be Latvian fish, it can be uh, Kazakh uh, sausages. It's all Soviet Union and even something for Russian best you can buy there in this place. And that's how it looked Russian world. When Putin told us that there is Russian world and we have to fight for it, I don't believe him. But Russian world outside the Russia, it's a still a reality. And you know what's strange? There are some Russian phenomena, Soviet phenomena, that uh, still uh, survive in uh, American immigration. For example, Bart's song. It was very popular during the Soviet time and people called, gathered in the forest and camping and play guitar and sing their songs. And you can believe, but there's a lot of such things in America. Thousands of people came to these camps to sing the songs, it's Bart songs. And they are very happy without the Soviet Union, but they still have this habit. Another thing, it's a play KVN. It was very popular during Soviet time. It's a TV game in the 60s it started. And Soviet Union has already disappeared, but KVN still have this kind of uh, game. And in New York University, there's two teams <laughs> which play these games every year. So we have this, uh, a lot of things that connected us with the old country. And uh, I think that if Russians can live without government, without country, without this stuff, it's still in our culture, in the wide sense of this word. Culture is this restaurant, culture is this Russian best, culture is our vacation, culture is everything. And it's still, of course, without books. Hey, thank you. And um, I mentioned that we um, read some Joseph Brodsky here today. On Wednesday, we're going to talk about Mikhail Barushnikov and Ballet Russe in um, the United States. Um, we're going to read some uh, Nabokov. And for today, the students read your um, uh, essay about Sergei Davlatov, who I think is a rather underrepresented figure in um, the uh, Russian curricula at the universities. Not many people read Davlatov or even know about him. So um, I was wondering if you can talk uh, about some specific figures like them in Russian immigration of your generation um, that stand out to you and um, whom you would call like the shapers of your generation's ethos in exile really sort of outstanding exiles, um, the way they handled the uh, plight of exile, their resilience, their nostalgia. You mentioned Solzhenitsyn who did go back. And I was wondering if you can reflect on what does it mean for you to go back or not to go back like Joseph Brodsky never went back. So uh, what are those figures that you see as absolutely central for understanding Russian immigrant experience? That's a great question. And of course, it's not so, it's, it's a, long, a long story. But first of all, we have to think that there's a three monumental figure. And first of all, Solzhenitsyn, who is a Nobel Prize winner, who is a guy who changed the history of the Soviet Union and of the whole world. And uh, he, choose very unusual way to live in exile. He still lived in the Russia. He was afraid to lost to lose his Russians. And so he was in exile 
double exile. He lived in Vermont and he almost never appeared in America. America was forbidden land for him because he would like to be Russian and he would talk with Russian history, not with Russian people, but Russian history. For example, he never noticed our presence in America and he never answered to our letters, he never participated in Russian life in America. He thinks that he's, uh, he only can talk with Russian soul and with Russian history, and his destiny was to change this history. So he was a very single-minded person. I knew people who knew uh, Solzhenitsyn. I never seen him. It's strange because I, I knew everybody else but Solzhenitsyn. And uh, they told me that he works 20 hours a day and he tried to be as isolated as, as possible. He has four uh, desks and he worked for four books in the same time. And uh, that's how American life was for him. Another guy who changed uh, the Russian poetry forever, it's Brodsky, and he was also Nobel Prize. Can you can imagine the time when in America live two Russian Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> it's a strange. Yeah? Uh, Brodsky was another example of uh, pending immigration because he thinks that he talked with not this Russian, not this Russian language, even. he talked with uh, language. It itself, he uh, tried to figure out how to live inside the language and time. And it was metaphysical life and metaphysical experience. And uh, Broski, of course, was God for us. And uh, not only for us, for everybody. Now, now he's the most popular uh, writer in Russia. It's like Pushkin, it's the second Pushkin for our generation. And, uh, but he wasn't like Solzhenitsyn. Everybody knew him and he helped a lot of people. Uh, he wrote prefaces for many poetry books. And once I asked him how he wrote so many prefaces, he said, you know, I don't interested in other poet, other people's poetry, so I better say something good about it. And uh, Broski was a very friendly type of poet but he was Olympian, he was a god. And the third was Davlatov. Davlatov was our size. He was, of course, very big guy. He was two, uh, six feet, more than six feet uh, height, but he was uh, our guy and he lives among us. And he was my personal friend, of course. And I think that he explained how to live without ideology. ideology. And it's important because Russian culture was either Soviet or anti-Soviet. And a lot of didn't like this dichotomy. And he said that, no, we talk about people as they are without any glasses, party glasses, without thinking about their politics. And that was so important for the next generation. When uh, a lot of the book came to Russia, he became the most popular writer in prose writer in this modern literature, and he still is. It's a pity that Americans don't like him anymore because they loved him very much when he, when he, visited, he appeared in New York and he published in New York many times. And Kurt Vonnegut once said, wrote to him, you know, I fight for this country during the war. And they did publish me in New York, but they do publish you in, in New York. It's not fair, but they were friends, of course, it was a joke. And uh, I once asked, what happens with Davato? Why you stop publishing him? It was uh, ask editor of New, York, New Yorker. And he said, you know, he died. So he lost. If he died, you lost. In Russia, completely different story. If you died, you won, because you love the death. Writers more than the life. So I think it's the uh, uh, three persons that more most important for the third wave of immigration. But of course, it's not only persons. For example, I'd like to say a few words about Russian artists in exile. Uh, they 
invent a very funny story. It's called Sotsar, Komori Nilamit, two guys who invented this story, and Babich Bichinyan, all my personal friends. They works with Soviet images in ironic way. And if you can, can you see some, uh, can you look? I can put some up if you want. Um, uh, can I do that and then share the screen with him? Can you just make a share screen? Yeah, it's not up yet. So you need to exit for me. Um, so I pulled uh, up four images, um, and then I'm going to share my screen, and you can start which uh, with whichever you want. How do I? Can I share my screen? Yeah. So yeah. let me go back to the Zoom. Thank you. <laughs> And then share screen, and then we're going to go to desktop one. Here we have to allow it. Okay. It's technology. Ah, sorry. I thought I already have. Yeah, I'm looking for system preferences here. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me pass it in real quick. We have to the allow, computer. Yeah, we have to allow it to share the screen. All right. Oh, we got to quit and really good zoom again, which means we got to uh, disconnect and reconnect. Um, well, maybe later. Uh, let, let's just return back. I'll just put the pull up the pictures for um, the students, and I'll tell you what they are looking at. Uh, I know. Just so show them. This this is the they are looking now at the picture of the centaur. Ah, this is Reagan. Somebody asked me who is this person, and it was yeah. funny because you didn't recognize your president. It's this role of Reagan and he is part cowboy, part president. And that's how they work with uh, images. But the most important, not Reagan, Reagan it's for fun. But another story about Stalin, they reinvented the Soviet history and they put now Stalin in. At, sorry, now they are looking at Stalin with, uh -huh. the, with some kind of a Greek figure, a muse or something. That's muse. That's muse, of course. Right. <laughs> and it's funny because, of course, they uh, they show Stalin with completely wrong <laughs> situation. And it's uh, ironic, sarcastic commentary for the Soviet history. But what's important about this, it was in the mid 80s when Sotsart became popular in the Soviet, in the America, in America. And now you can find the paintings in every museum, in modern art museum, for example. But it was a new, and I asked them, what do you want to show us? What is this, so sad? How to explain it to plain people? And they said, I'm sorry for this uh, comparison. It's not very nice, but it's true. They said, you know, everybody has two pounds of shit in them. And they hate it, but that's the part of them. And this is our Soviet history. And Stalin is this kind of this, these things. And uh, what's important that you live with this and you suppose your Soviet history is a part of our life even in America. It still uh, works in, in, in this situation and you have to know what to do with this. They try to put it in a sarcastic way as you see. And that was very important. And I think that it's still important because nowadays Putin uh, shows how he can be uh, imagining in this sarcastic way too. Uh, 
So I pulled now the picture of the Stalin's bust with two young pioneers. Mm -hmm. And these two young pioneer, pioneers is Comer and Milami. It's two mm -hmm. artists who imagine themselves uh, near Stalin. So it was a part of Russian America too. And it was an important part. And I think that they uh, show us how we live here. And you know what's important? It's still with us. And uh, that's why many Russian people who live in America for many, many years, uh, decades maybe, they uh, became easy prey of Putin Russia now. And it's strange, but you have to understand that uh, this Soviet uh, shit is still in us. <laughs> I'm sorry for this word. <laughs> All right, and then uh, can you just say a few words about um, the image of Lenin that you sent me, um, you know, with his cap all over his eyes? It's another work of social art artists who imagined it, who invented it. It's Bagrish Bukhchinyan, who is Armenian, but he was in Russian culture, he's from Kharkov, and he was my closest friend. And it was very famous work by him. Uh, you see, Lenin, usually uh, looks like with this head. It's very common image in the Soviet Union. But Wagrich made one small move. He, uh, he put his head a little bit lower and he became look like a bandit, like a hooligan. And it's a completely different story. So he changed a few inches, but Lenin, instead of the hero and genius, became a evil guy, evil guy, and a bandit of some kind. It was uh, that's also so sad. That's how we work with our Soviet past. All right. So we thankfully have some time now for student questions. Uh, now that we have looked at some images, and um, I'm going to go first uh, to one of Soren's questions. Soren is right there. And um, he uh, seems to be interested in difference between Brodsky's and Davlatov's prose in America. And his question is that um, the, they seem to be polar opposites. Uh, Brodsky was long-winded and Davlata was uh, more subdued, reticent. And do you think that helped bolster their relationship, their friendship? You know, that's a wonderful question. And I'm glad that you asked it because that's completely true. And the strange story is started with this one. When Davlata write in Russian, he actually write in his syntax was very English-like. He was started to write when he read a lot of American writers in Russian translation. And his uh, prose writing is very English style. It's not Russian at all. It's very short sentence. It's uh, very easy to understand. It's very concise. It's not Russian at all. But Brodsky, <laughs> opposite case, when he, uh, wrote in English, he wrote like in Russia. And that's a strange story because you're absolutely right. He's used long winded sentences. And uh, we, we Russians like his English uh, text because they look like Russian text. In English, of course, he wrote in English, but it's still very Russian like. Once he said that we are Russians, we are people of subordinate clothes and that's why we always have to explain more and more. We can't stop. And he, uh, he had a say on Dostoevsky. He said Dostoevsky is, of course, a big defender of the good people. He was a defender of God, of everything that is good. But no writer in the world was defender of evil too, because he couldn't stop. <laughs> he uses long sentences to explain everything. And that's why he became so complicated. That's exactly the story of Brodsky. And uh, it's funny because uh, Brodsky definitely wrote in English, and a lot of never used English, he wrote only in Russian. 
but they somehow change the place. It's a strange story, but that's true. And uh, Brodsky once wrote an essay about the latter at the best, and he said that his uh, Russian text is very good for translation in English. That's why I think that it's so important that the latter was more popular in America readership because he's easy to translate. Not of course easy, everything is difficult, but he's easier than many other authors because he, uh, he was very close to American writers. And it was part of his uh, psyche, I think. He, he loved American writers much more than he liked Russian writers. And, and it was even before he came to America. For him, America was like for all of us, it was the country of his favorite writers. His favorite writer was Hogan, as a boy, and Savage. So your question is absolutely right. I mean, I think it's very good that you notice the difference. All right. Um, uh, Sasha, I'll ask you a little bit more to speak. Um, I'll ask you a little bit more. Let's ask you a little bit more. It's coming, then it's coming, then it's coming, then it's coming. So if you're a little bit more to speak, it's better to listen. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a question that uh, another student, Maggie, has. And she said, I noticed the similarity in the naming of your book, Red Bread, and they read some of that today. And was it at all influenced or inspired by, not by Bread Alone, by Vladimir Dudinson? It's a very nice that you know the novel by Dudinson, because even in Russia, many people forgot about this novel. It was very important during Khrushchev era. My father, for example, was expelled from the, his work because he read this novel and shared it. It was a dissident novel. Of course, it wasn't dissident at all, but it looks like one. And when they translated it in English, in America, they published it and review was very short. You can know about, if you read this novel, you know about tubes much more than you wanted, you ever wanted to know, because it was about, it was about uh, production of some kind of tubes, I don't know how it called it, for oil. So it wasn't really, really very important, but we loved it a lot in the 50s and 60s, people was crazy about it. But it, of course, not, uh, my red bread not came from this novel, and the title of this novel came from Bible, of course, not bread alone. Uh, but my title came from another story. Russians eat their bread, uh, they uh, choose the bread by color. We have white bread, we have black bread, and we have gray bread, but we don't have red bread. So I invented it, <laughs> so that's why it's a story. Red bread, uh, the bread is connected with the Soviet history, with uh, red, red country. Um. Another question that Maggie asked, and I think a lot of us share curiosity about that, um, and we're going to discuss that as the class uh, moves on. She asks, many of your um, writings have been translated. Uh, do you believe through translation any aspects are lost or changed completely? The most troublesome is humor. It's very difficult to translate anything that is funny. It's a terrible thing to trying to translate something that rooted in your culture and context. And it's of course the first thing that you can lost in translation. Davlatov, who was very interesting about translation, his works once said that I don't ask translator to translate word by word. No, smile by smile. Of course, everybody wants this, but it's very, very difficult. And uh, uh, when I read my book in translation in English, I always upsetting because it can be done. I, I see the many, many, not even mistakes, but just you missed opportunity to make a smile. But that's why I love uh, translation of languages that I don't know. For example, Japanese, I have a book in Japanese, and I can understand only one word, because it's the only one word which was written by Latin alphabet. Can you imagine what kind of word is this? That you can't find any Japanese uh, sign for translation of this word. 
No, you can. KGB. <laughs> they use three, three letters because they can't translate it any other way. And it's much easier. But of course, translation is a very difficult part of our life. And for Russian writers, always uh, very complaining about this. Broski, for example, says that it's impossible to translate him. He better write in English. And that's what he do, what he did. And he wrote a lot of English, but he couldn't translate it back to Russian. To Russian. It's another story because if he translated, he changed it. So it's it doesn't work. You can read, you can write either Russian in English, but you can't do it both way. But some people can, of course, did, like Becky, for example. He wrote in French and then translated himself to English. But it's a very, very difficult task. So translation is always the most important problem of any writer like exile. So I want to ask uh, another question. This time it's Liam's question. And he's asking, there is a phenomenon among many exiled Soviet writers of being forced to adapt to an American society that allows free expression, but is different to its exercise. Do you think this phenomenon is exclusive to the intelligentsia or does it extend to all Soviet emigres? Adoption to Americans difficult for everybody and especially for people who came from the Soviet Union. That's a completely different system. It's so different that you can't use to it very easily. I'm sure that people who came from Europe, for example, it's much easier for them to adapt it to American system. And especially for us, because we didn't have any idea where we're coming. You know, I always uh, uh, compare the situation with a historical accident. You know, we came to this country and we tried to open it, but instead of one country, we came to another country, completely different. Not that we expected one, but we are not the first one. Columbus took this exactly the same mistake. He came to America and he tried to, he, he thinks that he came to another country, so Asia. Yeah? So it was happened to us too. So it's very difficult. For writers, it's of course much more difficult because we lost our readers, we lost our context and we lost, uh, we adapted to American uh, readers very difficult and some people tried it and some people lo lose it. For example, very famous Russian writer Aksionov, Vasily Aksionov, who was a favorite writer of my generation, uh, came to America, he lived in Washington, and he tried to adapt to American readership. And he wrote a novel in English. So he tried to, to, to be American writer, but he didn't success with this. And he translated his novel from English back to Russian. It was a strange story, but it's always, always difficult and uh, very few people who can manage it, like Nabokov, for example, and of course, Brodsky who wrote something in English, and, but very few samples of this. Mm -hmm. So uh, since you are uh, talking about the Aksionov, Aksionov actually did come to our campus too. Uh, many years ago and visited and gave a lecture on the novel. Steve, you probably do remember that, right? So um, we will be reading in this class, um, he's uh, in search of melancholy baby. Uh, so we'll be reading some of that and uh, believe it or not, we'll be reading some uh, of uh, Eduard Limonov, uh, just for contrast uh, in prose and general attitude. So the question that I am going to ask you is Ellis. So Ellie, you can raise your hand to be seen, right? And she's asking, do you feel that an American could have made the observations you, you write about in USA from A to Y? How have American audiences reacted to your analysis? And you can include in that Aksionov's or Limonov's analysis of their culture and institutions in the past. So as an emigrant, uh, when you look at American society, how do you think American audiences would relate to that? Uh, it's an interesting question, but it's two questions because Aksionov and Limonov, 
a very difficult, <laughs> different people. And the America, it's very different too. And I think that uh, both of them very important for Russian audience, more than for America, because they uh, opened another America for uh, Russian leaders. Uh, Aksyonov's America is the same that uh, he lived he loved in Russia when he lived in Russia. Uh, he was part of this bunch of writers who loved America by, because of the jazz, because of the uh, movies, because of the writers and Melancholy Baby is of course part of this love, his nostalgia for this America. And he tried to find it in uh, real America and it was uh, conflict between uh, his remembrance and his real life in this country. Limonov, another story, it's a story of uh, lost love and uh, it's a very uh, traumatic story. And I don't like Limonov, I knew him very well and I don't like him, but I can say that he is oh, one yeah. of, but he is the one who really wrote very sincere book and it's uh, you, you 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 can't miss it it's something important the Vlato, for example who was much more <laughs> better writer than limonov but he loved this book at a edichka and he wrote 70 other books when he came back to russia came back to russia but uh, it's the only one which was a real thing and i think that it's still important Talking about me, it's another story. I don't, uh, I didn't try to do something uh, really important. I just um, try to notice some interest, interesting things about banal thing in America. What is drugstore or toilet or or uh, movie theater or car or anything else? Anything that you can get in. And uh, people who read this in uh, Americans, they were was very, uh, tried me to ask me, why do you write about such banal things? It's not interesting at all. But for us, I think it's interesting because it's look different. Everything was different for me when I came to America. And I tried to get this experience in writing. And it was like my opening of America. That's very, very simple things that you can, uh, you, you can see anywhere. And it was universal experience for immigrant from the old world. That was the idea of the small book. So since you are talking about the mundane uh, reality you cover in Red Bread, I wanna read to you Daniel's question and Daniel, you can raise your hand. And um, Daniel is asking, I'm interested in the car section of Red Bread. I would love to ask, why would you think that the availability of cars is essential to the democracy and preempts the revolution? Of course, it's not a very serious uh, notion, but I still believe that car is a freedom. It's a freedom, freedom to move and a private vehicle. It's very important to have a private mode of transportation. You go whenever you want, not, not the train, not the subway, not anything. And in Russia, car, not nowadays, but uh, in my day, car was a very rarity. And you have to be with another people. You have to move with a crowd. And this is a uh, forced intimacy that was not really like, uh, it was really nice for anybody else. And Orwell once said that America was a free country when you can uh, hit your boss and move to the West. And that's what you can do, <laughs> still can do. At least you have idea with fantasy of it. You get your car and go to the West. And I think that it's still very, uh, it changed your, attitude for anything and uh, car and roads and the big country it's all connected with freedom and it's a chance for to be yourself and the uh, car was a very uh, very interesting experience for me for example i think that when you drive a long way and you are alone with yourself and it's like church on the wheel you 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 are 
thinking about anything. I mean, you're isolated from the world and you're inside it. It's, it's a very strange phenomenon. Not in Europe, I think, because Europe too small for this. You can, if you drive five hours in Europe, you can uh, change three countries. And in America, you change five uh, station, gas station. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Okay, um, great. So, um, you know, uh, Russian writers utilize humor. We read in Russian and there is a lot of laughter and maybe that was a way to deal with a horrible reality first back in the old country and then in the immigration. So I'm gonna ask a question that Miles is asking. Um, and Miles, you here? Oh, yeah, Miles, <laughs> you here. So in Davlatov and surroundings, you discuss how Davlatov thought that humor must serve a purpose to be utilized properly. Do you subscribe to this idea today? And I'm going to add to this that what is humor in Russia might not be considered humor in America. So we laugh at very different things uh, in Russia and in America. And sometimes we laugh at the same things, so what do you mean by saying humor must be utilized properly? Maybe elaborate on that. Is it true that we laughed at different things? For example, in America, America is very big, so we laugh about big things. For example, O. Henry, who was a very popular writer, American writer who was very popular in Russia, once I came to Texas and I said, you know what O. Henry said about Texas? He said, no, we don't know. Because it's strange in Russia, everybody knows who Henry. As they said that Texas is so big that nine oranges made a dozen. That's how Americans <laughs> kind of joke. You got it? Nine oranges made a dozen. So it's a very big oranges. In Russia, the completely different story. Uh, we are small people and big country. Uh, we are, because Russian humor is always connected with the people who are very uh, subordinate to the government. And so it's uh, humor is the only thing that you can uh, do in this situation because you are powerless. And humor of powerless people, it's the people of Jews, people of Armenians, that's very important was Armenian radio. It was a part of the joke. And uh, it's always people who are, uh, we have in Russian, uh, Russian literature, a very popular uh, type, it's small people, small men, little men. And uh, this is humor of little men. Talking about Davlatov, uh, he, what he told me about the humor, he said that you don't try to be uh, funny all the time. You're supposed to use humor only in very special situation. First of all, it is when it's something terrible happens. The best humor is near the grave. Black humor, it's the kind of humor that you love more, more than anything else. And uh, of course, the best writers who use humor in this situation is Beckett, maybe an Irish writer who said that it's not anything in the world so funny as a uh, tragedy. And even Shakespeare, it's also, he always used humor in very tragic situation. Joker came to, on the scene when something terrible happened. And Davlatov used humor exactly the same way. Uh, it's always, you can find the funny part in, uh, in some terrible situation and that's how it works and I think it's an uh, important lesson for me too. So you can, uh, you, you're supposed to be economy, economical with your humor. I mean, you, you must use it with uh, smart ideas, with some, some art, artfully. So I'm gonna uh, move to the question of stereotypes and um, because it's something we're going to discuss in this class and uh, related to our readings. So Raymond here, um, sitting next to me, he asked the question uh, whether or not uh, Russian exiles when they entered into the United States, uh, were they familiar with the stereotypes that Americans had about them? 
and how did they play or did not play into those stereotypes? No, of course, we didn't know anything about this because we can't, we couldn't see any movies about Russians. You know? like, for example, I never seen James Bond movie uh, in the Soviet Union. It was forbidden, of course. And then I came to, to America, I've seen all this James Bond movie, I love them. But it's funny that all Russian uh, evildoers, all Russian uh, officers, KGB men, they have uh, names of Russian writers. Gogol, for example, <laughs> it was funny. And I still uh, don't like how Russians uh, stereotype in uh, American movies. You can watch whatever movie you want about Russians, but it will be necessary seeing the Russians drink vodka. It's true that we drank a lot of vodka, but not from eight in the morning, not, not every time, not with any situation, but Americans always show us with vodka and it's funny. I have a friend who worked in Hollywood. He became very popular American uh, movie actor. And he always play Russian in such, in very different situation. Once he played Brodsky, can you imagine? Maybe you remember there was a Syria MacGyver. I don't know, you're too young to remember it. It was in the 80s, I think. And uh, MacGyver was a guy who can do anything. And he came to Russia uh, to this prison and in the prison there was a Brodsky. They, don't name, they didn't name him, but it was understandable. It's a famous Russian poet. And they keep, kept him in prison. And MacGyver came to, to him and he said that, now we go to America. And Broski said, wow, I will have jeans. <laughs> That's such a stupid stereotype of Russians. Of course, it's not very pleasant to, to watch it, but I, I, I don't like any movies about Russian at all. <laughs> So um, I want now to just uh, ask, uh, I guess there are some people who are more interested in like your personal experience. So I'm going to read Ruth's uh, question and Ruth, um, Ruth is right there. Um, so how uh, she's asking, what would you say is the biggest difference bet between how you build your career in Russia versus in America? <laughs> it would have been very different way you would have lived as a writer in Russia, as opposed to the way you did in the United States? It's, it's very easy to answer because I did build my career in Russia. That's why I came to America, because I couldn't do in Russia exactly what I'd like to do, to write <laughs> and publish in Russia. And it's very stupid, but I have to move to America across the ocean to do exactly the same that I supposed to do in Russia, but it was impossible. And that's why I came to America for only purpose. I, I will never emigrate if I could uh, publish my writing in Russian. Not only me, every writer never left the country of the languages, if he, language, if native language, if he can be published in, in Russia. So it's not uh, very difficult to answer this question. I didn't have any career in Russia at all. And by the way, I was 24 years old. 24? Yeah. 24. So um, uh, we talked in this class and we'll continue talking about um, Jewishness within Russian immigration. What does that mean to be Jewish, but at the same time, a Russian immigrant? So I'm going to read you a question by Caden. Where's Caden? Oh, here. It's Caden, yes. And so he asks uh, on page 36 of Davlatov and surroundings, uh, you know how Davlatov only clarified his relationship with his Jewishness once he was in Russia. Does this point emphasize the importance of ethnicity within Russian culture and its political system? Um, know the larger concept of immigration of migration, or does this mean something different? Uh, so, what but, does it mean to understand? Like, I'm Armenian and you are Jewish, but we're both Russian immigrants. What do you make a point of emphasizing ethnicity? 
uh, you became Jew when you come back to Russia. That's very easy. Because what is a Jew in America? Nothing. It depends on who are you. If you are a religious Jew, you're a Jew. If you're not, you are not. And nobody is interested about your Jewishness. I, nobody asks you, are you a Jew? What's important about this? It's nothing interesting at all. And it's maybe in New York still, because it's a lot of immigrants, Jewishness can be funny. Like Woody Allen, for example, he's definitely Jew. And it's an important part of his life. But uh, because it's, he made it funny. But uh, when we came to America, we lost our Jewishness. If, of course, we didn't find it, a lot of people became religious Jews. I knew a lot of, I knew a guy from my school and he, I seen him in Brooklyn and he became, became uh, a Sidim and he was very religious. And it was funny because I remember him completely different. He was a part of pioneer. <laughs> But it's another story. And when I, in Russia, Jew is always foreign, always strange, always dangerous, always traitorous, treacherous. You, you can be trust Jew at all. And you always remember that you are Jew. Even the word Jew is not really very nice to say. Uh, that's a lot of euphemism of this. Vainovich once said that, I, in one of his book, you ask him, are you Malanitz? And he said, what Malanitz is? Malanitz is a Jew. Why don't say Jew? No, no, it's not polite to say Jew. <laughs> so it's a strange story about Jewishness and uh, Russian uh, context. And it's completely different here. And uh, for Davlatov, he was part Armenian, part, part Jew. But as he wrote once, uh, part Armenian, part Jew, but I was uh, called Estonian nationalist <laughs> because he lived in Tallinn and he wrote something wrong about the Soviet life. So uh, it's nationality, ethnicity, it was very important in Russian, but it's not important here. Excuse me. So um, looking ahead, and I know you're probably getting tired, and um, we just have kind of um, a little bit forward-looking questions, and so I'm going to ask a question that Connor had for you. What do you think the next wave of Russian immigration, if any, will look like? It's already started. Uh, 400,000 people left Russia last year. And it's uh, another people, not like us. It's young, the people who has profession, who has future, who knew language, who know how to drive a car, for example, what they did. And uh, these people will uh, change America. Maybe I heard that in uh, Silicon Valley, 100,000 Russian IT, IT people works. And I think that it's a great, loss for Russia and great gain for America. But uh, these people, uh, they're different. They're people of the world. They are more, much more cosmopolitan than we are. And uh, of course, internet made a completely different story. We left Russia forever. And it was like another life and another death because it was not, they wouldn't be able to come back and no one believe that they ever see Russia again. But these people, they can move easily around the world. And I don't know what kind of life was there, but I think that they will lose Russian culture much easier than we are. They're not connected as we are with Russian literature, with Russian ideas, because they're already much more cosmopolitan in their attitude. But it's still too early to say something about the fourth wave. It's doing, it's happening right now. And uh, um, since it's another of Connor's question that uh, he's asking, I'm sure a lot of people are asking, especially now, uh, witnessing what's happening on the border with Ukraine. Um, what effect do you think Vladimir Putin's leadership uh, has on the perception of Russia abroad, especially in America? 
I've been here in America during the Cold War I, so I can easily understand how it will work. I remember when uh, Afghan war started in 1980, I was here in America and I've seen every bar in New York pour out Stalichna vodka. It was a lot of uh, vodka on the street because they don't want to sell any Russian vodka. And once I came during this time in 1980, I came to the bar uh, and uh, playing pool. And I said, let's play with Russian rule. They have different rule for playing pool. Saying, you know, you will play Russian rule in Afghanistan, not in America. I remember how it was. Uh, during the Afghan war, all Russian cab drivers became Bulgarian cab drivers. No one wants to be Russian. And I think that it would be the same. My son went to school and he said that, you know, it's not very well to be a Russian in my school. <laughs> he was in the first grade. And it was not very nice, of course. And I think that would be exactly the same if the war started. Putin, many times he said that Russia, that's a lot of Russophobe around the world who hate Russians. But I lived here for 40 plus years, never seen any Russophobe at all. No one. I knew only one Russophobe and he is in the Kremlin because he made everyone enemy. Uh, you, he, uh, there's a circle of enemy around Russia and it's uh, what Putin made with this situation. Everybody hates Russia. The closer you live to Russia, you, 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 more your hatred for you. Um, for example, Baltic country or, or Poland or Bulgaria or anything. Anyone is uh, hated Russia and Putin who made it. And I think that it was very, very difficult situation for all Russians in the world. So um, since we going to talk a lot about uh, literature in this class. I want to uh, read you Michael's question. And Michael, you can raise your hand to just be seen. But um, what do you think are the fundamental differences between American writers and Russian born writers living in the USA in terms of their content and approach to writing? There's two things. First of all, Russians, like all writers, need your context. And context of Russian culture is very deep and very rich, and it's very difficult to get rid of it. And uh, you have to understand a lot of things when you read Russian writer, because we are very close to our literary roots. Russian literature was everything for Russian writers. Uh, it's uh, instead of religion, instead of politics, it was everything. So it's... Uh, rooted in literature much more than American writers. American writer can write without any mention of another writers. You can read Hemingway, for example, and never met uh, name of uh, another American writers, but it's very difficult to do with the Soviet, with Russian writer. Another thing is the form. What's funny about this, that when you came to America, me, for example, you uh, started to write much shorter <laughs> sentences and your book became slimmer and slimmer. And uh, I think that it's influence of American writers who prefer short books and who prefer short, slim, uh, concise writings. It is, the Vlato is the best example of this one. And I think that it's uh, influenced very much. Uh, and of course, uh, when we've been in the Soviet Union, uh, Russian Soviet literature was very during the Soviet time, during Brezhnev time, it was very outdated. And American writers was uh, has a lot of experience with modernism, and uh, that's what's important for us too. And uh, it's influenced a lot about uh, with modernism, and of course with movies. You know what's important? What we have context in Russia, it's literature. In America, movies, mass culture, and we lost this context, uh, when we, when I talk with Americans, I always understand that we didn't understand each other because I didn't have this uh, experience in my youth. I don't know American uh, animation movies. I don't know sport figure, figures. 
I don't know a lot of mass culture movies like Star Trek, for example. It was difficult for me to understand what is this. And it's a part of misunderstanding with Russian movies in America. Oh, thank you. And um, I just want to uh, turn to our audience for like last questions in case uh, you want to ask. Go ahead, uh, please. Yeah, so I was just wondering if you ever can, I don't know if you can, but if you ever considered moving back to Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union, and if so, what held you back? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, it was once. It was once. I came to Russia first time after 13 years of immigration, and it was uh, 1990s. It was very difficult uh, period in Russia. It was hunger. You, you can buy anything, you don't have money. It was very difficult to live, but it was a freedom. It was the first time this Russian can find your, the fate. It was like young democracy, and it was so nice that young people try to do completely different things without government, without anything. They try to be themselves, and I envy them. It was the first and last time because very soon the democracy was over, the freedom was distinguished and uh, it was ugly. And I stopped coming to Russia. My books periodically published in Russia every year, but I didn't come to Russia after the Crimean story, after annexion of crime, crime Crimean, and I hated to come to Russia because they elected the it's not nice to be there anymore. Any more questions? Thank you very much, Sasha. Uh, Thank you, my friends. It was very nice to talk with you. Спасибо большое. Спасибо вам. Спасибо. Всего доброго. Всего хорошего. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.